John and I have been working in autoimmune disease and kinase inhibitors for, for a long time, uh, longer than some of you have been on the planet, I think, based on how young some of you look. Um, we're just learning about dermatology, and I think it's an exciting moment in time for kinase inhibitors and hopefully JAK inhibitors to, um, to play a role here. So, so I'm going to uh, sort of tell you a 24-year story in seven slides. I'll try to do it succinctly and, and clearly. Um, the path from the idea for a JAK inhibitor to a drug um, went through many hurdles, um, and I'm going to tell you about some of the key ones that I think inform the process to, to the point where we are today. Um, I'll start out by telling you about uh, David Vetter, the original Bubble Boy, and how the science around the Bubble Boy informed our drug discovery. Um, I will tell you about the benefits of being stupid. In my case, it helped quite a bit in the early parts of the uh, program. I'll tell you about why wild monkeys are better than monkeys that are uh, bred in captivity. Uh, I'll tell you about a new dance move that was first um, performed in Arkansas, which is not a normal place for dancing to uh, occur. Um, the market and how that informs or impinges on uh, drug discovery. Um, systemic autoimmune diseases and uh, something for you dermatologists. <clears throat> Um, so this is uh, David Vetter. He's the original Bubble Boy. I know that many of you young folks in the audience learned about the Bubble Boy from an episode of Seinfeld a few years ago. That is not the real Bubble Boy. This is him here. Um, like his brother before him, he was born with X-Link Skid. Um, he, the physicians um, in Texas uh, who realized that this family was going to have another boy um, with this disease. Um, of course, his brother, like all the kids who had this disease, died at the age of six months because of overwhelming infection and failure to thrive. They uh, convinced the family that if they could keep um, David uh, in a sterile environment for a long enough time, they would master bone marrow transplantation and they would be able to cure him. Um, David lived um, in this bubble for 12 years, um, and it was uh, very stressful to the family. The picture you're seeing here, um, David was, was grabbed 20 seconds after cesarean birth, put in the bubble. Um, this is the first time his mother held him at the age of four years. Um, unfortunately, he had the bone marrow transplant, um, and that led to uh, his death. It was a mismatched bone marrow. He had an EBV lymphoma. Ten years after David's death, um, the laboratories of uh, Warren Lander and John O'Shea at the NIH, and, and as well as others, um, discovered the molecular basis uh, for X-Link SCID as well as SCID. <clears throat> and what they discovered was that mutations in a kinase known as JAK3, or its associated receptor chain, the gamma chain, is what caused these kids to be so immunosuppressed. So immunosuppressed. And in subsequent um, years following that discovery, uh, a better picture of why this is the case uh, was developed. So this is the AL2 receptor. Um, let's see, do I have a pointer? I don't think so. Um, uh, the, the alpha, beta, and gamma chain are, are shown there. It's the gamma chain that associates with the uh, beta. Do I have one? Uh, the, it's the bottom. Uh, OK, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so I think you guys uh, all know about this, so I won't, I won't belabor it, but basically um, the gamma chain uh, is unique to the IL-2 receptor as well as the family of receptors that um, uh, utilize it, and that's shown on the next slide, uh, or on the, on the next uh, panel on the right, um, not only is, is it involved in IL-2 receptor, but a family of six cytokine receptors, 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. What's unique about JAK3, unlike all the other JAK kinases, JAK, JAK kinases in the family, JAK1, JAK2, and TIK2, all of those members are quite promiscuous. They'll bind to a mul multiple uh, different cytokine receptors. In contrast, JAK3 will only bind to gamma chain, and it's that module that we wanted to target, thinking, okay, we know that without JAK3 or the gamma chain, you're quite immunosuppressed. We were trying to make immunosuppressive drugs for renal transplantation, um, and so that's why we decided to target JAK3. And it was a simple idea at the time, and unfortunately, no one talked me out of it. <clears throat> Um, now a bit about the advantages of being not very bright. Um, back when we started this program, um, the first thing we had to, my lab had to do was develop enzyme assays for all, jack, uh, all four JAK kinases so we could inform the chemists in terms of what they were making in terms of its specificity. Um, and the time, uh, assays were run in 96 well plates. They were solid phase assays. You would slap a polymer of glutamic acid and tyrosine down on a plate. You'd throw your enzyme in, develop the whole thing with an antibody to a P-tire. 
Um, this was complete anathema to enzymologists. Um, we were not running enzyme assays the way a bona fide card-carrying enzymologist would do. I, of course, had no idea, and so I continued along my merry way. And that's how we set up the assays. The other thing that was true at this time at Pfizer, um, there was a, a law that had been promulgated by one of the directors of chemistry. Um, and he said, we will never make a drug that targets uh, a, a, a kinase or any sort of protein that if, in the, if it's knocked out in a mouse, if the, if the knockout is embryonic lethal, that would be dangerous. We argued on the biology side that this was ludicrous because we're not treating embryos, we're treating adults, and this really shouldn't uh, uh, drive our decisions in terms of what targets we go after, but that was the law at the time. And JAK1 and JAK2 are both embryonic lethal, and so it was very important that we not inhibit those enzymes or not inhibit them tremendously. So we set up these assays, and in 1995, what we, sh what we were able to find was a very potent inhibitor of JAK3, a one nanomolar inhibitor of JAK3. It was about 20 nanomolar enzyme inhibitor of JAK2, and over 100 nanomolar against JAK1. Very excited. We had nice specificity. We tried to improve that JAK2 window. We never could. And in the meantime, we put this compound into numerous in vivo assays, and it worked very well. And the concern about JAK2, for, for many of you, I'm sure you know this, JAK2 controls the EPO receptor, so you worry about anemia. We didn't see this in our animals, so it was fine. Um, uh, it turned out, um, and as I'll tell you, the, the program that we had started and, and pursued for about 10 years was ultimately terminated because um, uh, Pfizer decided they were not interested in organ transplantation. So 10 years, 10 years later, um, our group was disbanded. Um, and one of the things that happened is the program was transferred to a group that had bona fide um, card-carrying enzymologists. They ran the enzyme assays, and these are the actual numbers for, these, for, these, for this compound. It's basically a pan inhibitor across JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3, at least at the enzyme level. Um, I can tell you that if we had, had we generated this data back in 1995, um, the law that had been promulgated by that chemist would have killed the program. And if I had been a better uh, enzymologist, I would have killed the program. Um, fortunately, shortly um, after this, this uh, occurred, we were able to move forward, and, and we didn't really discover this until much later. <clears throat> Okay, so for those of you who are familiar with renal transplantation, you realize that um, it's, it's, a, it's a, one of the uni unique therapeutic areas where the immunosuppression you induce by providing multiple drugs to these patients is justified because you're trying to preserve this life-sustaining kidney. Um, and at the time, and actually to this day, calcineurin inhibitors, both cyclosporin as, as well as Prograf or FK506, are the mainstay drugs that are used. It's ironic, of course, because both of these drugs are nephrotoxic, and you've just gotten a new kidney, and you're taking a drug that is destroying your kidney, but that is, is the situation. And our, our goal at the time was to make an inhibitor that was immunosuppressive enough where we could get rid of the calcineurin inhibitors and, and have a long-lived kidney survival. <clears throat> Um, the interesting thing also about ther uh, therapeutic drug development in kidney transplantation um, is that unlike many, and unlike all other therapeutic areas where you can do your animal testing in mice, rats, or dogs, or even in the case of dermatology, say pigs, um, in kidney transplantation, the only way you can convince a kidney transplant group to test your drug in human patients who have waited five years for a new kidney is to generate data in um, uh, non-human primates. And not only non-human primates that typically come from some of the captive breeding programs that exist around the world, you have to use wild-caught animals because they are a lot closer to human beings in terms of their ability to rapidly reject a kidney. And this is a function of the large number of infections they've had over the course of their lives. It's really the memory cells in those animals that drives the infection. So we had to do this um, using wild-caught animals from the island of Mauritius. Um, and what we did was compared uh, as monotherapy using our JAK inhibitor to cyclosporin, which was the, which was the standard of care at the time, as monotherapy in uh, non-human primates. Uh, and if you look at this figure here, if you can see it, if I can point it out. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Um, this is uh, on the, on the, y, on the x-axis, you're look, looking at days post a transplant. So we carried these animals out for three months, 90 days. Um, in the absence of any drugs, uh, all the animals uh, reject quite uh, vigorously within seven or eight days. That's very reproducible. We did a few animals just to uh, ensure that we, our colony of animals was, was equally uh, potent. Um, what you look at, look at in this line here is the cyclosporin. These animals were dosed with cyclosporin at therapeutic exposures based on what human beings get. Uh, four, five of the six 
animals had rejected by about day 35. One of them made it out to about day 72. Um, here are the animals that were dosed with uh, various doses of, of uh, topocitinib or, or, or 690-550 at the time. Um, four of the 18 animals never rejected. Um, the survival that was seen here, uh, according to the transplant group at Stanford who did this work for us, is the best they'd ever seen. So we're very excited about this. Um, and eventually this drug went into phase two, and there are actually patients who were um, uh, maintained with a healthy functioning kidney for over five years uh, with this drug. Okay, so just to go back a little bit to the, um, are you going to throw me out? Okay, um, very quickly then, uh, as we get into autoimmune disease, um, because our drug in um, uh, non-human primate toxicology studies uh, created some lymphomas, the FDA said you can't go into normal volunteers, you have to go into patients who could potentially benefit. Um, and so we went into um, uh, psoriatic patients, um, and not only did we have to go into patients, but we had to, to dose them for two weeks in a captive environment, basically. They were in hospital for two weeks. What this provided the clinicians was a very close um, view of how things were going on these patients, and what you can see is that there was very good improvement um, within two days. This is at the top here is the histo um, immunohistochemistry at baseline, and, and two weeks later, uh, this work was done by uh, Jim Kruger's lab at the Rockefeller, um, and, and you, you've seen these kinds of slides before, and I won't, I won't belabor the details. Basically, many of the infiltrating cells were gone after two weeks. The interesting thing that was sort of anecdotally relayed to us was that a number of the patients in the trial not only had psoriasis, but psoriatic arthritis. And the clinicians, although it wasn't power to look at this, noted that a lot of the patients who came in limping were dancing at the end of two weeks. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> Um, at that point, uh, the marketing group um, said, okay, well, transplant's not a big enough market for us. We're going to dissolve the transplantation group, and you guys should figure out something else to do with your lives. Um, we, we did a number of things at that point, um, but the first thing we did was say, okay, what if we use this drug at a much lower dose um, in an autoimmune disease? And so we put it into a standard collagen-induced arthritis model of RA, and it worked very well. Um, and then from there, over the course of the following few years, we went into a number of other diseases. Um, as you know, it's been approved um, as Zelgans and RA. Um, it's been through phase three for UC as well as psoriasis. Um, and there's obviously a lot of interest in the last year or so uh, around dermatological diseases, and we're going to hear uh, more about that as well. Um, so I think we're at a point where, um, because of our much better understanding of the role of cytokines and certain cell populations, jack kinases in particular, in diseases like vitiligo and alopecia, for sure, um, the opportunity to treat these, these diseases with jack inhibitors is significant. Um, and hopefully, as John will tell you, we'll be able to make some potent compounds both orally as well as topically. Um, and so now I will hand it over to John. Thank you.